we're going to find out why Mormonism was actually needed on this earth, why did Joseph Smith say it was necessary, and what's the whole deal with the necessity for the restoration of the gospel. We're going to discover that right now. We're in 1st Nephi chapter 13, that's where we're going to start, and we're going to make sense of Mormonism, if that's possible. Okay, so 1st Nephi chapter 13, we're in the Book of Mormon. This is going to tell us why we needed the Book of Mormon. Here we go. Here's the summary. Nephi sees in vision the church of the devil set up among the Gentiles, the discovery and colonizing of America, the loss of many plain and precious parts of the Bible, the resultant state of Gentile apostasy, the restoration of the gospel, the coming forth of latter-day scripture, and the building up of Zion. All this somewhere between 600 BC and 592 BC it says. So we're going to we're going to check this out. <clears throat> if you like the scriptures being read, you'll do a little commercial here for Book of Mormon reader. She reads the scriptures and she's got these scriptures like this just rolling and uh, if you're if, if you're into listening, you can do that if you want to learn how to read. If you're not great at reading yet or it's a foreign language to you, great opportunity. She does a really good job. Um, anyway, there's a little commercial. And I was looking at her stuff this morning, and, and that reminded me, you know what, I need to do something on First Nephi chapter 13, because she did that on September the 11th when she got back to her Book of Mormon reading here. Anyway, that's a YouTube thing. So here we go. This is Nephi, and he's having a vision. He's gone to talk with the Lord God. To get it straight, maybe he's maybe he read James chapter 1, verse 5 before it was written. Who knows? Here we go, just like Joseph Smith. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me, saying, Look, and I looked, and I beheld many nations and kingdoms. This is 600 B.C.-ish, okay? And the angel said unto me, What beholdest thou? And I said, I behold many nations and kingdoms. And he said unto me, These are the nations and kingdoms of the Gentiles. And it came to pass that I saw among the nations of the Gentiles the formation of a great church. Another thing I was going to say with that, that I didn't mention is I like to comment sometimes on Book of Mormon readers, uh, on, on, on the Book of Mormon reading that's being done. So uh, sometimes there's some stuff in the comments for me, or sometimes I'm making videos uh, that are related to that because... They're important topics relating to Mormonism. Okay, so, and the angel said unto me, Behold, the foundation of a church, which is most abominable above all other churches, which slayeth the saints of God, yea, and tortureth them, and bindeth them down, and yoketh them with a yoke of iron, you know, like oxen, oxen and stuff, you know, basically enslaves people, yoketh them down into captivity. So, verse 4 said, And it came to pass that I saw among the nations of the Gentiles the formation of a great church. Now this sounds like a new word to Nephi because, you see, the word church is never found within the Old Testament at all, ever, zero. So maybe the angel explained to him what a church actually was secretly because he's not saying it here. It's as if Nephi's supposed to know what a church is when there were no churches. So he didn't have any frame of reference that I'm aware of. It's almost as if he's got a 19th century knowledge already, except this is his first vision. And it came to pass... I think it's his first vision. It's pretty close to it, anyway. And it came to pass that I beheld this great and abominable church, and I saw that the devil was the foundation, was the founder of it. And I also saw gold and silver and silks and scarlets and fine twine linen and all manner of precious clothing, and I saw many harlots. Prostitution or immorality rampant in this great and abominable church. I think you should start talking about the priests. And the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold, the gold, and the silver, and the silks, and the scarlets, and the fine twine linen, and the precious clothing, and the harlots. Was he trying to make poetry here? I think Joseph Smith was a rapper. Oh no, we're talking about Nephi, excuse me. And the desires of this great and abominable, are the desires of this great and abominable church. So, they're after all the things of the world, right? Yeah, sex partying, and uh, money, gold, silver, real money, not this Federal Reserve notes, 
garbage. And also for the praise of the world do they destroy the saints of God and bring them down into captivity. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld many waters, and they divided the Gentiles from the seed of my brethren. Many waters. Like the Atlantic Ocean. And it came to pass that the angel said unto me, Behold, the wrath of God is upon the seed of thy brethren. Meaning the Lamanitas inheriting the promised land. He's looking into the future here. And he's checking out the Lamanites, the American Indians. Well, <clears throat> at least at least till we get to the DNA testing, that's what we'll figure. And I looked and beheld a man among the Gentiles who was separated from the seed of my brethren by the many waters, and I beheld the Spirit of God that it came down and wrought upon the man. And he went forth upon the many waters, even unto the seed of my brethren who were in the promised land. Now, we see sometimes in some of these uh, additional things here in the front of the Book of Mormon that that's supposed to be Cristobal Colon. Cristobal. Not crystal ball. <laughs> Christopher Columbus. And he came unto the seat of his brethren. Really? Where was that? Like the Bahamas and Costa Rica? All right. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, like around where Haiti or the Dominican Republic is. Hispaniola. Puerto Rico. La Habana. La Habana, Cuba. Okay. And it came to pass that I beheld the Spirit of God, that it was upon the gen other Gentiles, and they went forth out of captivity upon the many waters. Okay, so Christopher Columbus was a really inspired guy. He didn't die of VD, you know. Um, he was an inspired guy. He didn't massacre native peoples in the islands or anything, right? And the Spirit of God was upon these other Gentiles, so they went forth out of captivity upon the many waters. And it came to pass that I beheld many multitudes of the Gentiles upon the land of promise, and I beheld the wrath of God that was upon the seed of my brethren. Uh-oh. Not good for the Lamanites. And they were scattered before the Gentiles, and they were smitten. Okay, so God was with these Gentiles, and he brought them forth out of captivity. That just sounds like a manifest destiny doctrine, doesn't it? Now, when we really look into American history, if we get away from the uh, correlated garbage they get in the school system, we find out that the Negroes from Africa were not the only people that came in chains. Actually, we can find, if we are researching well enough, that perhaps up to half of the colonists at, one, at, 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 at some given point there, after quite a while, actually came in bondage as slaves. So, um, you know, and, and trying to cover that up and call them indentured servants like it's, you know, like they're all working... Uh, you know, learning how to be scientists or something, doing an apprenticeship. No, they they, they were, um, you know, they were they they were harvesting crops. Um, just just uh, actually, I think they preceded the, the the black slaves. They found out the black slaves uh, held up better uh, in places like Barbados. They weren't dying as quickly as the white ones. But what we're seeing here is, is it says, says that God was leading them out of bondage, but thousands and hundreds of thousands of people were kidnapped in Europe. That's where the term comes from and uh, taken to America in bondage to the Americas in the Caribbean and enslaved. So um, I, I guess Nephi missed that part. Maybe the angel wasn't communicating clearly. <clears throat> kind of like God telling us that, you know, they had horses, but he meant tapirs. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that the Gentiles who had gone forth out of captivity, there we go again, out of captivity, but that's not true. You had the slave masters and the slaves, and then you had, you know, maybe some other people uh, that fit this mold. And they did humble themselves before the Lord, and the power of the Lord was with them. Okay, so God was in this thing. And I beheld that their mother Gentiles were gathered together upon the waters and upon the land also to battle against them. This is starting to sound very USA-centric. Um, Nephi, guess what? You know, the Portuguese uh, had their people down there in Brazil. What became Brazil? The Spanish had their people in about, you know, another dozen countries in South America and about seven in Central America plus Mexico. I mean, you know, it wasn't all about the British and the colonists in the United States. But, I mean, don't we have Lamanitas, you know, 
all the way to the tip of South America? What's going on here? Why is this all about the United States? Okay. So, uh, and I beheld that the power of God was with them, and also that the wrath of God was upon all those that were gathered together against them to battle. Oh, God got angry with the British. He didn't like those lobster backs. And I, Nephi, beheld that the Gentiles that had gone out of captivity were delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations. Wow. America the Great. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that they did prosper in the land, and I beheld a book, and it was carried forth among them. Do we know what book that is? <clears throat> this is before L. Ron Hubbard wrote Dianetics, so that's not it. And the angel said unto me, Knowest thou the meaning of the book? And I said unto him, I know not. And he said, Behold, it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew. Wow. And I, Nephi, beheld it. And he said unto me, The book that thou beholdest is a record of the Jews, which contains the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. And it also containeth many of the prophecies of the holy prophets. And it is a record, like unto the engravings which are upon the plates of brass, save there are not so many. Nevertheless, they contain the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel, wherefore they are of great worth unto the Gentiles. And it went forth from the mouth of a Jew. Hmm, interesting. Last I checked, the Old Testament, which they are describing, went forth from many Jews. And the angel of the Lord said unto me, stay tuned, we really do get into a lot of important stuff here. This is We're going to define what Mormonism is about here in this chapter. Even if it takes a few minutes, you may learn quite a few things. And the angel of the Lord said unto me, Thou hast beheld that the book proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew. And when it proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew, it contained the fullness of the gospel of the Lord of whom the twelve apostles bear record, and they bear record according to the mouth, to the truth, which is in the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Twelve apostles. What twelve apostles? What's an apostle? This is 600 B.C.-ish. I hope he explained what an apostle was. I hope he explained what Je who Jesus was. In fact, I hope he told him how to speak what Greek was, since Jesus' name is Greek. Okay. The apostles bear record. The fullness of the gospel of the Lord. It, it sounds like Nephi's supposed to know what all this Christian stuff is, 600 B.C. It does, okay? The gospel of the Lord. Isn't gospel kind of a Greekish kind of a word? <sighs> Isn't it? Okay, anyway. Wherefore these things go forth from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles according to the truth which is in God. The fullness of the gospel going forth from the Jews in purity. So the Jews had the purity of the gospel. They had the fullness of the gospel in their writings. And did the Jews write the New Testament? It's written in Greek. Could it have been Romans? And after they hey, go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb from the Jews unto the Gentiles, thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church. Okay. Which is most abominable above all other churches, for behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. Now let's be clear here. The Jews had various scrolls or writings, parchments, whatever they were, separately writings of various of their prophets. Guys like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, whatever, or, or books written in those pen names at least, you know, and the books of Moses. They didn't have what we have in the New Testament. And they didn't have all of these together in one book from a Jew. The Catholic Church actually collected and selected what we've got in that Bible that he's saying went forth from the Jews. The Jews didn't have a Bible. There were various, various writings 
the Catholic Church selected these things. The great and abominable Catholic Church selected these things. So he's acknowledging here that that that, that the Catholic Church is obviously, you know, in the one that had the Bible, but he seems to think that it actually had some sort of, you know, a, a, a collection of, of these various writings before the Catholic Church got a hold of them, but that's not at all true. They actually selected what it is they wanted to become that the collection, that, that encyclopedia of <laughs> religious writings, so to speak, that collection, that library. Wherefore thou seest that after the book hath gone forth through the hands of the abominable church, no, sorry, Nephi, it didn't go through their hand, they created the book that abominable church did, that there are many plain and precious things taken from the book, which is the book of the Lamb of God. There was no book of Lamb, any, was never any book of any Lamb of God. Sorry. Various writings of various prophets, and then the New Testament writings, and there were all kinds of other ones. And the Catholic Bible, by the way, had like 73 books. That's about 10 more than the, you know, Protestants use. And after these plain and precious things were taken away, it goeth forth unto the, all the nations of the Gentiles. And after it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles, yea, even across the many waters, which thou hast seen with the Gentiles, which have gone forth out of captivity, actually in captivity for about half of them, thou seest, because of the many plain and precious things which have been taken out of the book, which were plain under the understanding of the children of men, according to the plainness which is in the Lamb of God, behold, excuse me, because of these things which are taken away out of the gospel of the Lamb. Do you ever notice how all the prophets in the Book of Mormon ramble on the same way Joseph Smith does? Just a coincidence. And exceedingly great many do stumble, yea, insomuch that Satan hath great power over them. I'm not saying I don't ramble on, but, you know, it's kind of strange that, like, a dozen of these guys are so ramble on the same way Joseph Smith does, like, chapter 50 in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, Genesis. Okay, Satan has, has great power of them because of this screwed up Catholic version of the Bible, because they took all this important stuff out. Like, you know, every single Old Testament book is missing the doctrine of baptism, for instance. The Catholic Church took it out of, like, three dozen books. Didn't you know that? I'm not vouch I'm not saying they're good. I'm just saying they left the Law of Moses in, but they took baptism out, right? And all kinds of stuff that we find within Mormonism that apparently the Catholic Church took out. Oddly enough, we don't find these things restored in the Book of Mormon. Well, we find baptisms in there, yeah. Baptism, but uh, the structure of the church, no. Maybe because he hadn't come up with it yet. Nevertheless, thou beholdest that the Gentiles who have gone forth out of captivity and have been lifted up by the power of God above all other nations. Go USA, right? USA uber alles. Was that Hitler or Trump? Upon the face, make Germany great again. Oh, I keep getting it mixed up. Upon the face of the land, which is choice above all other lands, which is the land of the Lord, the Lord God hath covenanted with thy father that his seed should have for the land of their inheritance wherefore thou seest that the lord god will not suffer that the gentiles will utterly destroy the mixture of thy seed which are among thy brethren so he's going to he's seeing ahead of time that there will be nephites that wind up going back that, that that become unfaithful and turn into lamanites and are part of the lamanite people that god is not happy with but he's a little, he still loves them a little bit. He only has the Gentiles kill about 50 million of them. Reminds me of the Three Amigos. They did have a television version of that long ago that wasn't like, you know, PG-13. I like these guys. They are funny guys. Just kill one of them. Just kill about 50 million of them. I guess God helped. They got smallpox, and syphilis and stuff. Neither will the Lord God suffer that the Gentiles shall forever remain in that awful state of blindness which thou beholdest they are in, because of their screwed up Bible, because of the plain and most precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb which have been kept back by that great, by that abominable church whose formation thou hast seen. 
Maybe we should read that about five more times, Joseph Smith. Wherefore saith the Lamb of God, I will be merciful unto the Gentiles, unto the visiting of the remnant of the house of Israel in great judgment. Okay, so he's being merciful to the judgment as they kick the trash out of the Lamanites and take their land and mass murder them. And it came to pass that the angel of the Lord spake unto me, saying, Behold, saith the Lamb of God, after I visited the remnant of the house of Israel, and this remnant of whom I speak is the seed of thy father, we're talking Lamanites, American Indians, wherefore after I have visited them in judgment, like I said in the last sentence, and smitten them by the hand of the Gentiles, which I've said about three times, and after the Gentiles do stumble exceedingly, which I've said about five times, because of the most plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb, which have been kept back by the great and abominable church, which is the mother of harlots, saith the Lamb, I will be merciful unto the Gentiles in that day, insomuch that I will bring forth unto them in mine own power much of my gospel, which shall be plain and precious, saith the Lamb. I guess that means Joseph Smith will be born and save us all. For behold, saith the Lamb, I will manifest unto thy seed that they shall write many things, which I shall minister unto them, which shall be plain and precious, and after thy seed shall be destroyed and dwindle in unbelief. And also the seed of thy brethren, behold, these things shall be hid up, to come forth unto the Gentiles by the gift and power of the Lamb. I guess he's saying that the Lamanites, that the Nephites will write lots of things down, and it'll become the Book of Mormon, and it'll be hidden in a hill right next to Joseph Smith's house. And in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lamb, and my rock and my salvation. So I ask, what is it that the Book of Mormon teaches It's not in the Bible? Seriously. Um, little children shouldn't be baptized. doesn't give an age. Mm, God can't violate his own rules without not being God anymore in Alma, chapter 37, maybe. And it, makes, it gives some nice arguments about grace versus, you know, judgment and mercy and all that stuff in Alma. Okay, that's about it. Well, maybe there are a few things I missed. I'm sure somebody can think of some things. Are those really plain and precious parts that are missing? The rehash of Paul's faith, hope, and charity talk that's done in in uh, Moroni chapter 7. That's basically the same thing, but, you know, maybe Joseph Smith makes it a little plainer. Excuse me, Moroni. What was I thinking? And blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth my Zion at that day, for they shall have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. And if they endure unto the end, they shall be lifted up at the last day, and shall be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Lamb. And whoso shall publish peace, yea, tidings of great joy, how beautiful upon the mountains shall they be. Wow, we got a little Old Testament coolness in there, along with his New Testament rants that somehow... Moroni knew about oh, Nephi. Nephi was talking New Testament stuff 600-ish BC. Who knew? And it came to pass that I beheld the remnant of the seed of my brethren and also the book of the Lamb of God which had proceeded forth from the mouth of the Jew that it came forth from the Gentiles unto the remnant of the seed of my brethren. The Bible goes to the Lamanites. And after it had gone forth under them I beheld other books. Well, maybe he's talking about the Book of Mormon. <laughs> gone forth out of the mouth of Jew. No, that's a Bible. After it had gone forth out of out of the mouth, uh, forth unto them I beheld other books which came forth by the power of the Lamb from the Gentiles unto them. Unto the convincing of the Gentiles and the remnant of the seed of my brethren and also the Jews who were scattered upon the face of the earth that the records of the prophets of the twelve apostles of the Lamb are true. All those Jews turning into Christians and Mormons now. And the angel spake unto me, saying, These last records which thou hast seen among the Gentiles shall establish the truth of the first, which are of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, and shall make known the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them, and shall make known unto all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world, and that all men must come unto him, or they cannot be saved. Okay, that's great. Well, I'm pretty sure that the New Testament says that kind of thing. 
And so where are the plain and precious things that the Book of Mormon gives us? I just haven't seen a lot of it. It sounds like a rehash of New Testament Christianity uh, being uh, argued and, and so forth and, and quoted, quoted long before these guys ever lived that they're quoting, by the way, sometimes. Wow, like an Alma. Okay, and they must come according to the words which shall be established by the mouth of the Lamb. Can you just call him Jesus? And the words of the Lamb shall be made known unto the records of thy seed, as well as in the records of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Wherefore, they both shall be established in one. For there is one God and one shepherd over all the earth. All right, so we'll get our Book of Mormon Bible combination, and we know that we'll get it with the Doctrine and Covenants of Pearl Great Price and have our gnarly quads. And the time cometh that he shall manifest himself unto all nations, both to the Jews and also unto the Gentiles. And after he has manifested himself unto the Jews and the Gentiles, then he will manifest himself unto the Gentiles and unto the Jews. And the first will be last and the last. First, last will be first and the first will be last. So all the, the, the Jews will finally be converted to Christ. And so will the American Indians. So how's that going? Plain and precious things, fullness of the gospel was in the Bible. Well, Joseph Smith retranslated the Bible in the Joseph Smith translation or inspired version of the Bible. You can find it on the uh, Community of Christ website, I think. Look it up. That way you can read it. You used to find it easier on LDS.org, but it's getting tough. They've gotten rid of a lot of the hyperlinks I used to use when they put in this 2013 version. They got rid of hyperlinks. It makes it harder to find things. Things that maybe the church is a little uncomfortable with. Well, I actually have a few things from that business of restoring these things. I gmailed myself. Let's see what I've got here. Well, here we go. I got a few gems here that have been restored in this fullness of the gospel business here that the abominable church must have taken out. Like Trinitarian doctrine that Joseph Smith stuck in the New Testament. Luke! Chapter 10, verse 23. Should we just call it Lucifer? It's the same thing, it's just Greek here. Pretty much anyway, a light bearer. Lucifer, chapter 10, verse 23. Doesn't that sound good? All things are delivered to me but of my Father, and no man knoweth that the Son is the Father, and the Father is the Son, but him to whom the Son will reveal it. And you thought Mormons weren't Trinitarian. Yep, the Son is the Father, and the Father is the Son. Oh, we've got it in the Book of Mormon, too. Although they took out Mary being the mother of God, we still have a few things left. I'm in Ether chapter 3, verse 13. And when he had said these words, behold, the Lord showed himself unto him, and said, Because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall. Therefore ye are brought back into my presence. Therefore I show myself unto you. This is the brother of Jared getting freaked out when the Lord touches rocks and turns them into glowing magic rocks for his special submarine boats that should float on top of the water scientifically, but they stay underwater for some strange reason along with their flocks and herds and bees in rocky sea. Sounds like a great, a great thing, doesn't it? Verse 14 says, Behold, I am he who was prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. Now it gets interesting. I am the Father and the Son. Say what? I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. In me shall all mankind have life, and that eternally, even they who shall believe on my name, and they shall become my sons and my daughters. Become my sons and my daughters? If you're already the father, why aren't they already your sons and daughters? And never have I showed myself, showed myself, shouldn't be shown myself, showed myself unto man whom I have created. For never has man believed in me as thou hast. Seest thou that thou art created after mine own image? Yea, even all men were created in the beginning after mine own image. Behold, this body which ye now behold is the body of my spirit. And man have I created after the body of my spirit. And even as I appear unto thee, 
to be in the Spirit will I appear unto my people in the flesh. So, Jesus Christ is actually the Father. We saw it here in Ether chapter 3, and we saw it in Luke chapter 10, verse 23 of the Joseph Smith translation. It doesn't say that in the King James. Joseph Smith Trinitarianized the Bible. That's a plain and precious truth, that God and Jesus Christ are the same person. It was taken out of the Bible, at least in Luke chapter 10, verse 23, or 22 in the KJV. So, isn't that interesting? Plain and precious things. They were taken out by the Catholic Church, so Joseph Smith restored them in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible. These are some of the things he restored. Let's see, what else did he restore? Here's Genesis chapter 4 from the inspired version of the Bible, chapter 7. Corresponds to Moses chapter 7 in uh, Pearl of Great Price. But, you know, since Emma Smith, I guess, kept the uh, inspired version, church had to beg for <clears throat> some of it back or something. I don't know. I'm not sure on all the logistics there, but I had to get my Joseph Smith translation from the reorganized church, which is now called the Community of Christ. And I saw the Lord, but we do have the JST part in your quads, and it was on LDS.org and maybe, maybe in Joseph Smith papers or something like that, but like I said, hyperlinks are gone that connect a lot of things that made things easier, especially when we we're about to see now. So Genesis chapter 4 says, And I saw the Lord, that he stood before my face, and he talked with me. Genesis, Genesis, Genesis 7, 4. The Lord stood before my face, and he talked with me even as a man talketh one to another face to face. And he said unto me, Look, and I will show unto you thee the world for the space of many generations. Okay, so this is Genesis chapter 7, verse 4. This is about um, 1,100 years prior to the situation we just read about in the, you know, in, in the uh, <clears throat> Ether chapter 3 story of the brother of Jared. Okay, so this is Enoch he's talking to, by the way. And so, Enoch, Enoch is, um, this is like, what, 33, 13 B.C.? Love those numbers, all these Masonic and magic numbers. Um, 33, 13 B.C. as opposed to, say, 2200 B.C. And he just is appearing to Enoch face to face. But he just told the brother of Jared in verse 15 up there that he was the first guy to ever see him. I think Joseph Smith got high a lot. He really screwed up. He couldn't keep his story straight. He published this after the Book of Mormon. But now he's making himself into a liar, or Jesus, or both of them. All right, let's keep on, because it gets interesting. So now we know that Jesus appeared to Enoch 1,100 years before he appeared to the brother of Jared, but he lied to the brother of Jared and told him he was the first. I wonder if Joseph said that to, like, Emma. I wonder if he was lying. I don't know. <clears throat> Couldn't have said that to Fanny Alger and have her believe it, obviously. So, But he probably pulled that line on somebody. And it came to pass that I beheld in this valley of Shum, and lo, a great people which dwelt in tents, which were the people of Shum. And again the Lord said unto me, Look! And I looked towards the north, and I beheld the people of Canaan, which dwelt in tents. And lo, the Lord said unto me, Prophesy! This is Enoch still, so the Lord's telling him to prophesy. And I prophesied, saying, Behold, the people of Canaan, which are numerous, shall go forth in battle array against the people of Shum, and shall slay them, that they shall be utterly destroyed. So they're mass murderers. And the people of Canaan shall divide themselves in the land, and the land shall be barren and unfruitful, and none other people shall dwell there but the people of Canaan. For behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat, and the barrenness thereof shall go forth forever. I think about the Sahara Desert and so forth, but maybe that means like Arizona or New Mexico to somebody else. Who knows? Next verse. And there was a blackness that came upon the children of Canaan. So much for Arizona. That they were despised among all people. Okay, so... um. The Lord cursed these people and turned them black, and he put them in a very hot place where nobody else lived. So where do all the black people live, you know, before the slave ships got involved? That's right, Africa. Maybe Joseph Smith thought all of Africa was a big desert. Did he forget about, like, you know, Central Africa or something? 
I don't know. You got me. Next, verse 7, 14, we're going to skip ahead. And it came to pass that Enoch continued to call upon all the people. Oh, okay, so the intervening verses there, the Lord showed him all these people, and he said, start preaching the gospel. So he went forth and was teaching all these people and baptizing and stuff. So in those uh, four, three verses that we that I didn't bother to put in there, it basically says that the Lord was showing Enoch all these different people, and uh, Enoch was going to go preach to them all. So uh, maybe the Lord was transporting them all around the world. Who knows? Because the other people, you know, it sounds like they're off in deepest, well, I don't know about darkest Africa. It sounds like the Sahara Desert, you know, the barrenness went forth and, and the heat. But um, that's a long way from Missouri last I checked. Even if the continents were all together, it's still an awfully long walk. So anyway, those people were far, far away from Jackson County where Adam and Eve were hanging out, or actually Davies County, Missouri by then. And it came to pass that Enoch continued to call upon all the people, save it were the people of Canaan, to repent. So they just weren't worth sharing the gospel with, apparently. And that's why that verse is in there. Except for, it's a little bit different than that. <clears throat> Genesis, or Moses, chapter 7, verse 29. It says Genesis because I got this out of the uh, Joseph Smith translation of the Bible from the Reorganized Church, which should be word for word for the first eight chapters of Genesis. I don't believe that I'm wrong on that, because I've gotten this out of there, too. Moses, but I just happened to be reading that. So, And Enoch also beheld the residue of the people, which were the sons of Adam. And they were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, save it were the seed of Cain. For the seed of Cain were black, and had not place among them. So this is after Enoch and his people separated. So the super-righteous people were all with Enoch. And then they built the city of Enoch. But, um... The rest of the people were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, except for the children of Cain, who were black and did not have a place among them. So, that's kind of weird. Canaanites had to turn black, so they couldn't have already been part of the seed of Cain, unless it was a delayed blackening of Cain when he got the mark upon him. Assuming this is from the mark of Cain, since they are Cain's descendants. But Joseph Smith wanted to make sure we knew that Cain's descendants, and the Canaanites were Negroes, who are the people that cannot have the priesthood, as we learn in Abraham chapter 1, because it says they're Canaanites. Genesis chapter 7, verse 41 of the inspired version, But behold, they are without affection, and they do hate their own blood, and the, fi and the fire of mine indignation is kindled against them, and my hot displeasure I will send in the floods upon them, for my fierce anger is kindled against them. So that's about the Genesis deal, so Mormonism definitely takes the biblical flood literally. <clears throat> There's a lot more in chapter 7 of the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price about that. Okay, now we get to Genesis chapter 29 of the inspired version, which we do not find in the LDS scripture, except for we do, but not as one canonized thing. They have excerpts, or they did anyway, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the quadruple combination. So we have excerpts, and if they're big ones, they're at the back, you know, they're, they're, at a, they're in a special location. Otherwise, they're at the bottom of each page in footnotes for the little ones. So Genesis chapter 29 says something different than it says in the King James. And what does it say? Chapter 9, verse 29 is where I'm starting. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his, what his younger son, youngest son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan who is the son of that son, and had zero to do with it, so God's just being a jerk here, cursing Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Notice the spelling of Canaan is different than the Canaanites. No, I mean than Cain. It's the same as the Canaanites. Next verse. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant, and a veil of darkness shall cover him, that he shall be known among all men. Okay, so he'll be covered in a veil of darkness that is easily noticeable that he shall be known among all men. So Joseph Smith lets us know that Canaan and his descendants were cursed with a veil of darkness to differentiate them so we would know them. Therefore, we would know who the servants should be, I guess, according to what it just said. He must be a servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Okay, so there we have it. So, Canaanites are dark. We've got it in multiple places. Uh, 
And now, in Abraham, chapter 1, Now this king of Egypt was a descendant from the loins of Ham, and was a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites by birth. Now, Ham didn't have a tan going on, so it came from his wife. From this descent sprang all the Egyptians, and thus the blood of the Canaanites was preserved in the land, the land of Egypt, being first discovered by a woman who was the daughter of Ham and the daughter of Egyptus, which in the Chaldean signifies Egypt, which signifies that which is forbidden. Of course, at the time of Ham, there only was one language. And at the time of Abraham, there was no Chaldean there. And the Chaldeans weren't in Chaldea, or Ur of the Chaldees, for another thousand years the Bible screwed that up, according to all the historians. So that's an anachronism. So I was using the word Egypt, since that's Greek, and wasn't invented at the time that Abraham was around, supposedly. When this woman discovered the land, it was underwater. Must have been due to the flood still, huh? She took a long walk from Mount Ararat. Who afterwards settled her sons in it, and thus from Ham sprang that race which preserved the curse in the land. Now the first government of Egypt was established by Pharaoh, the eldest of the son, son of Egyptus, and the daughter of Ham. So Ham and his wife Egyptus had a daughter named Egyptus. And it was after the manner of the government of Ham, which was patriarchal. Pharaoh, being a righteous man, established his kingdom and judged his people wisely and justly all his days, seeking earnestly to imitate that order established by the fathers in the first generations in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam, and also of Noah, his father, using the word father, father liberally as, a, as an ancestor, I suppose, who blessed him, blessed Ham, I guess, <clears throat> with the blessings of the earth, or Canaan, maybe, Ham, who knows, and with the blessings of wisdom, but cursed him as pertaining to the priesthood. Now Pharaoh, being of that lineage by which he could not have the right of priesthood, notwithstanding the Pharaohs would claim, fain claim it through Noah, from Noah through Ham, therefore my father was led away in his idolatry. Okay, so Egypt and Egyptus are supposed to mean that which is forbidden. Egypt signifies that which is forbidden. The word Egypt didn't exist in the time of Abraham, and it means like the place of the departing of the soul it has nothing at all to do with being forbidden. But that whole thing is to tell us that Ham married a woman from the forbidden race who had a Negro child because she was already pregnant, I suppose. That's not in here. They would have mulatto children, according to this, but according to the Curse of Cain legend, she was already pregnant from some other fully black guy, apparently. Otherwise, everybody would look like Obama. Hey, maybe they do in Egypt, but uh, not in the Congo. So, um, those are some of the plain and precious things that Joseph Smith restored to us. And many people stumbled because they didn't know that. Well, although there were hundreds of thousands of white slaves, which we find that history tries to not let us know about because of the political correctness theme that they like to have, we do know that plenty of Negroes were enslaved without this doctrine. So I guess the Christians managed to uh, decide on their own that Everybody should be enslaved, I guess, if they had hundreds of thousands of European slaves and African slaves. I don't think they really... We can't call them discriminatory. They're willing to enslave everybody. Yeah. It's like a friend of mine said, who's a, a black guy from Jamaica. And he said, when they got the Federal Reserve together, those bankers that did that, they said, why should we just enslave the Negroes when we can enslave everyone through this banking system? And he was right. And the LDS Church seems to be very helpful in enslaving people, tithing everyone and contributing donations to the United Nations programs, ripping people off and telling them that it's God's law, taking their time, destroying their weekends, and ruining people's lives, especially those who decide that they don't believe in it and then are ostracized, especially young men mission age who are ostracized and if you live in Utah especially in a small city small town you're ruined no decent girls gonna marry you cuz you're a loser <sighs> yeah well anyway um, we learned a lot about these uh, incredible truths that the uh, Catholic Church took out of the Bible sure they're evil their priests like to molest people 
and they had the Inquisition, and they've burned people at the stake, and, you know, all those horrible things. I'm not, I'm not doing anything to try to clear the Catholic Church. I'm just saying, whatever Joseph Smith restored in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible, which supposedly had the fullness of the gospel, and the Book of Mormon supposedly had the fullness of the gospel, because we read that Jesus Christ said that in section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. I've said it many times before, the fullness of the gospel doesn't appear to be in the Book of Mormon because most of the doctrines that Mormons are known for, celestial marriage, premortal existence, three kingdoms of glory, three degrees of glory in the celestial kingdom, and let's not forget polygamy, are not recommended as doctrines, are not taught, other than polygamy being an abomination, in the Book of Mormon. So, that's what we have. That's what we learn about the restoration of the plain and precious things that the great and abominable Catholic Church took out of the Bible when they got it straight from the mouth of a Jew. Or the book that the Jews put together, which they didn't put together. <sighs> oh, Joseph Smith. I think he did a lot of drinking. He did a lot of something that confused him because his convoluted story between the Canaanites and the seed of Cain is really screwed up. The more you read it, the more you go, say what? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, but the main point is that, you know, anyone from Cain or Canaanites would be Negroes and they can't have the priesthood according to the book of Abraham, which should keep them out of the temple, which should keep the Freemasons happy who have segregated Freemasonry there. And you couldn't have Negroes and whites together doing Freemasonic rites, which is exactly what was going on in the spring of 1842. The same exact time Joseph Smith became a Freemason and introduced Freemasonry into the endowment is the same time he belatedly decided to translate the Book of Abraham, which he hadn't managed to do for seven years, even though he spent a lot of other people's money to get it, even though he worked on it, it says, in LDS history in 1835, like during the summer and the fall of 1835, I believe that was when it was, for, you know, we spent quite a bit of time on it, and apparently a seer stone wasn't working too well because it's about three days' work, maybe, with a seer stone at the rate they said he translated the Book of Mormon with the seer stone. Why couldn't he do it that, that way again? It's only, only, like, what, five chapters? They're like, you know, two pages each. I mean, that's like two days' work doing the Book of Mormon. What changed, Joseph Smith? Too many moving parts in your brown rock? Your hat got a hole in it? I mean, what was the problem? Moroni stole the magic glasses? Somehow, he couldn't do it anymore, but when he needed it to uh, not have a problem with the Freemasons, mixing blacks and whites with uh, <clears throat> Freemasonic uh, lodge activities, he learned really quickly how to translate ancient Egyptian, even if it all was wrong. Even if his Egyptian alphabet turned out to be complete and total BS, along with the hieroglyphics, and the representations and the facsimiles, everything being false. Hey, check out my, uh, especially for Youth 7, going over the uh, facsimiles. It's kind of interesting. You can learn a lot of cool stuff. Might be part of the fullness of the gospel. Yeah. Like, you know, Kolob borrows its, no, the sun borrows its light from Kolob, and it's ruled by another planet, another star, plus Kolob, all kinds of really weird contradictions, and uh, weird science, yeah, that's weird science. And there's plenty more than that. Anyway, God on a Celestial Jet Ski, it's cool stuff, check it out, especially for youth number seven, understanding Mormon astrotheology. Well, you heard it here, probably on the Dodger Game channel, Mormon Truth video, making sense or senselessness of Mormonism, reading the Book of Mormon and the plain and precious truths it restored, as well as what Joseph Smith put back into that Bible that the Catholics screwed up so much. Yeah. Well, let's finish in the name of the Age of Reason and encourage you to comment, subscribe, and all that kind of good stuff. Mormon Truth out.